Hi, everyone. Hello from all Hello. the way down here in New Zealand. Uh, hi, Christina. Hi, Urban Ashram Yogis. Um, it is really lovely to be here and really amazing that so many people have tuned in um, to listen to this introduction to meditation. I will wait just a little bit longer. It's only just on, well, it's three o'clock in the afternoon here in New Zealand. Um, so we've only just hit the time. So I'll give everyone a few more seconds, a minute or so to tune in um, and then I'll get cracking. Okay. Seeing if I can see any from seeing any familiar faces. Okay. Should we wait for magic number 60? Who's that going to be? <laughs> it's always a bit awkward, isn't it, when you're waiting? I've got 59 faces staring at me expectantly. <laughs> well, <laughs> here we go. Magic number 60. Okay. So Marikar or anyone else who has administrative powers, if you could just let people in whenever they pop in and I'll um, get cracking because we haven't got too long and I could talk about meditation way too long. Um, so my name is Claire and I am a meditation teacher and also a yoga teacher. I live in Auckland, New Zealand. Um, almost a year since I was actually over in Manila where I got to teach my meditation course. I teach a style of meditation called awareness-based meditation and I came over to Urban Ashram and had the most amazing experience there in Manila. Everyone was just so incredible. I was actually really blown away. It was one of my favorite teaching experiences. Um, that phenomenal group of people who are really receptive and open-minded um, and really eager to learn about meditation. And I'm very eager to talk about meditation, so it's the perfect combination. Uh, so that was almost a year ago, and I was hoping to come back this year. Unfortunately, 2020 has been, oh my goodness, it has been the most intense, challenging, trying year for so many people in, in the whole entire world that it really is quite phenomenal. New Zealand just came out of uh, a level three lockdown yesterday. We went back into lockdown for two weeks, uh, just here in Auckland. Um, so that was a really interesting experience. Our first lockdown, um, and I know you have all been in experiencing a far more intense version of lockdown um, and quarantine and isolation than almost anywhere in the world, uh, from what I understand. Uh, New Zealand's had this really kind of interesting experience where we went into full lockdown for about six, seven weeks, and then we came out and everything kind of went back to normal, sort of, except no one could really go anywhere and people weren't allowed to come in. And then we went back into it a couple of, for a couple of weeks. Um, so the second experience, it was really interesting to hear how for some people this time around, it felt a lot more um, comfortable and easy, I think, because we knew the end was in sight. Um, humans don't deal well with uncertainty and instability and a sense of not knowing what is in store for us. So I think uh, this shorter lockdown was a lot easier for people. Some people not so much. And I know um, a lot of my friends own small businesses. Um, a lot of my friends are in hospitality. A lot of my friends own yoga studios and are in the health and wellness industry. And they've been profoundly affected by this whole situation. But it's also meant 
we've had to get adaptable. And um, because of technology, I can be here with how many people? 65 people that I otherwise wouldn't have the opportunity to talk about meditation with. And uh, I think considering what you are all going through and uh, the challenges that we're all facing, um, teaching people how to meditate, most importantly, how to develop a daily practice uh, is something that I'm really passionate about doing and sharing with, with, with as many people as possible. Uh, because I know for me, I've experienced firsthand uh, the most incredible benefits from practicing meditation for over daily for over seven years now. Um, I was introduced to meditation through yoga. I lived in Los Angeles for 10 years. And uh, when I moved to Los Angeles, I was actually a journalist. So I worked in the news and I was uh, a television presenter and a news broadcaster. And then when I moved to Los Angeles, I went through um, a midlife crisis at about 30, uh, where I realized that a lot of my habits and coping mechanisms, namely um, very heavy drinking. Um, I was also in a really, really, um, what's the word? a really unhealthy marriage. Uh, and then I also worked in an industry that was incredibly stressful. Uh, and it all culminated at, at around age 30, me um, experience, experiencing terrible burnout and not realizing that I also had chronic anxiety and experienced low grade depression, probably for most of my life. Um, and both of those things do run in my family. But at the time at 30, I had no idea that that was happening to me um, or how bad my mental health had gotten because at that time we didn't really talk about anxiety or depression uh, we didn't really talk about how I didn't even realize that drinking as much as I was was affecting my nervous system um, the chemicals in my body that regulated my emotions that kind of thing had no idea but fortunately I just happened to be in Los Angeles at this time which was the an epicenter for yoga, meditation, um, and to cut a long story short, I left my husband, quit my job, and I became a yoga teacher. And I don't know if any of you have read Eat, Pray, Love, <laughs> the book Eat, Pray, Love. It was basically, I was, I was like that much of a cliche. Um, I even drove a little Prius, <laughs> which in Los Angeles is a, is a big cliche. Um, so, at that stage of my life, um, now no longer with a husband, and it was before I had uh, children, I had one son, Jack, he's six now, um, I was able to immerse myself in, first of all, the world of yoga, and um, trained with some pretty incredible teachers, and was introduced to the idea of a seated meditative practice. So very quickly, I understood that practicing the physical asana, so all the shapes we make with our bodies, um, which is something that I will practice hopefully till the day I die, um, I did realize pretty quickly that there was a little difference or maybe a big difference between physical yoga and actually a seated meditative practice. But for a long time, I kind of thought the seated meditation was for people who were able to sit still for long periods of time. Um, it was for monks or it was for people who had potentially removed themselves from the normal world and were living these extremely spiritual, enlightened existences. I didn't really, at the beginning of this introduction to meditation, understand that normal people with busy lives could incorporate meditation into their lives. I thought you had to meditate for hours and hours at a time for it to be effective. And then over the course of a decade, um, I was fortunate enough to study um, Vipassana meditation at a Buddhist center up in Malibu. And then I did a Vedic meditative course. And I think the Vedic meditation um, course, which is very similar to transcendental meditation, which is one of the most um, well-known. Well, I, I know here in um, Australia, New Zealand, America, transcendental meditation is something that's quite common and has become a little more accessible to people, although it is quite expensive to learn, unfortunately. Um, so I started 
learning about how we could have a meditation practice in daily life that was effective. And it turned out it didn't need to be hours and hours each day. Uh, the style of meditation that I practiced and have practiced for a really long time now is 20 minutes twice a day. These little bite-sized chunks that kind of sandwich my day. And I started practicing that before my son was born and I have been a meditator now. So through pregnancy, his birth, um, it was, I, I've never been so appreciative of my practice um, than when my, from my son being born till he was four because he was a shitty sleeper. And one of the most incredible things that meditation gives you is this deeply profound rest and rejuvenation. So 20 minutes of meditation is like three hours of deep rest. And I don't think I could have survived without that because he woke up five, six, seven times a night for four years. Um, and there are just so many benefits to a meditation practice. Um, it wasn't really until the 1930s that meditation came to um, the West in any, um, uh, how would you describe it, in a sense where people wanted to understand and practice it. And so in the 1930s in America, yogis started to be hooked up to EEG machines and heart rate monitors, and the effects of meditation was started to be measured. And um, they saw that meditation affected your blood pressure. They saw it affected the areas of your brain that produced um, the hormones that made you feel anxious or stressed. Uh, meditators uh, or the yogic masters that they were measuring were seen to be able to control even their body temperature. Um, and then since the 1930s, thousands and thousands and thousands of studies have been done on people who meditate. And the benefits are literally endless. So from helping us with anxiety, stress, depression, helping us re regulate our emotions, helping us become more emotionally resilient is one of the things that a consistent practice will do. And in times like this, can you think of any kind of skill that you need more of than emotional resilience? Interestingly, emotional resilience doesn't necessarily mean that we're happy all the time, or that life all of a sudden gets easier. It actually means that we develop this beautiful ability to accept what we're feeling. So if we're feeling angry, we acknowledge that. We don't tell the anger to go away. We don't tell ourselves that we're wrong for being angry. But in fact, with a meditative practice, which ultimately is a process of cultivating more and more awareness of self and our emotional responses and what's happening in our mind, we start to almost short circuit the automatic responses that have kind of ruled our lives. So for example, if we are in a heightened fight or flight activated stress state and um, our partner does something, or well, someone in our household, and we've all been in close quarters with people for a long period of time, or potentially been by ourselves now for a long period of time, someone triggers anger within us. Something they do seems to trigger anger within us. Instead of just reacting without thinking about it, and maybe that anger being um, vomited into that relationship, there's, with a meditation practice, there's more awareness around the emotion, there's an integration of the emotion and then there's a little pause or moment where we actually can make a choice to respond a little differently. But it's not about repressing or stopping that emotion because it's really important as human beings that we recognize we are emotional creatures. Our emotions are what make us human and they're actually beautiful. Anger has a place, grief has a place, even anxiousness, which tends to be fear, has a place and most of the time these emotions are teaching us something and with a meditation practice we start to listen we start to listen to ourselves we connect to ourselves we stop judging the emotions we let them have space and time and in doing so with that acceptance some of the emotion actually does start to dissolve and integrate 
And I think that's been one of the biggest benefits I've experienced with a meditation practice is emotional resilience and emotional awareness. Uh, another wonderful benefit is um, the amount of stress that your meditation practice launders or cleanses from your nervous system. So every time we sit, what we're ultimately doing is practicing going with the flow. So we spend a lot of time arguing with ourselves. If you really stop and listen to what's happening in our mind, it's not a good time a lot of the time. There's a lot of to and fro, back and forth. Um, if someone was listening to that conversation, it'd probably be profoundly confronting and embarrassing because it's nonsense. And um, once we become aware of the environment that we're carrying around in our minds and we stop this internal um, resistance and arguing and fighting, then our internal environment actually relaxes. And by sitting and letting the momentum of our emotions, letting the momentum of our thoughts have space without judgment, because every single time we sit, we're practicing watching rather than judging the thoughts and the emotions. When that happens, the nervous system just goes, Whoa. oh my gosh, it's safe. Even just by sitting quietly without doing anything, you're telling your physical body that I'm safe. It's safe. We can relax. We can let these emotions be released, be heard, be felt. Because the fight or flight response is all about survival. And even though this year has been incredibly stressful, um, and we have this looming invisible threat of illness that um, here in New Zealand hasn't been as uh, directly affecting as many people, but I know lots of people in your country have actually have actually got COVID. But for many of us, it's the thoughts about the danger that actually cause more problems than the actual illness itself. Yeah, it's our imagination, it's the future tripping, it's the what if that actually triggers a fight or flight response, even though we're not in any danger. Even though we're in our homes, yes, it sucks and we're all by ourselves and we've probably eaten the same thing for a really long period of time. But for most of us, we're actually not in any physical danger. Um, that's not to say we need to be careless with our health or irresponsible. And it's not to make light of the fact that lots of people have gotten sick and died from COVID-19. But for many of us, it's the thoughts about what could happen that create incredibly um, harmful, stressful responses in our nervous system. So every single time we sit to meditate, we are reversing that. We're laundering out the stress. And when we're not stressed, when we're not in fight or flight, when we're not fearful, then we actually can make much better decisions about what needs to be done, about the right action to take. Also, when we're not stressed, we're much more creative. So we're problem solvers when we're not stressed. Um, the human brain doesn't work at its potential when it's terrified or nervous or anxious. In fact, we get very tunnel visioned when we're nervous or anxious. But the more we can do to give our nervous systems a break, meditation is one of those ways. Um, other ways are trying to get outside as much as possible, which I know is fiddly and tricky in these times, but even just looking outside at the sky, going somewhere that where there's a few trees and communing with nature will have a profoundly restorative effect on your nervous system. Silence, quiet, getting off these things, even though I know they're a necessity, so that you can communicate and connect with your family, with your friends, really putting some boundaries on how much you use your phone. I've just, I've been off social media for two weeks now and I didn't really think my use of social media was that bad, but oh my gosh, my mood has lifted. 
Um, I've been sleeping better. I've been way more productive. I've been much more creative. Um, so that's been a really interesting little experiment for me, having some boundaries around screen time. There are all these things we can do to start to regulate our nervous system so that we can assess the situation we find ourselves in and potentially make different choices. Choices that never even occurred to us, maybe in terms of work, family, how to um, respond to a time that is profoundly challenging for everyone. So as soon as we unstress the nervous system, even just a little bit, everything starts to work better. Our digestion, we sleep better, our hormones regulate. Um, and all these effects of um, benefits of meditation have been measured. There are some incredible books that you can read on it. But for me, um, I think the most wonderful thing about the practice is that for 20 minutes twice a day, I commit to myself. And I have this moment to tune in and listen and really see how I'm feeling that day. So if I'm a little tired, I make adjustments. If I'm feeling energized, I make adjustments. I'll notice the quality of the thoughts in my head. And I know that as a woman, I'm really influenced by my hormones. So I know that certain times of the month for me, self-doubt creeps in um, and my self-esteem changes throughout the month. But I know because I've tuned in so much for so many years, not to believe it, not to believe the nonsense that percolates in my mind and just to keep making the little steps in the direction that I want to go. And it can feel like we're having to really change direction in times like this, but humans are designed to adapt. We are the most incredibly resilient creatures. We wouldn't have come this far if we weren't. So another beautiful thing that happens when you start to tune in, relax, and relax into the flow of life is that when challenges do come along, instead of seeing them as really ne profoundly negative experiences, often we really look for the lessons and the learnings and the teachings. And there will always be those in challenging situations. And in those challenges, we actually grow. We can't grow without discomfort. We can't grow without pain. We can't grow without um, surprise and unexpected things happening. Uh, and it's all about how adaptable and flexible uh, we become in those moments. And I know that my meditation practice has really helped me with, with flexibility and adaptability. It's not to say I don't have down days. It's not to say this year hasn't been challenging. Um, my studio has had to close on and off. My partner's gyms had to close. So, so many things have happened um, that we've had to get creative about how to do things. Um, and I hope that most of the time I, I really feel like I've risen to the occasion rather than um, let it get me down too much. But that's not to say that any emotion we're experiencing this time is okay. Yeah. But it's also getting a bit of perspective and space around those emotions. So I thought we would do just a little breath work practice together because we haven't got too much time. And then if anyone wants to ask me some questions, we might have time for a couple of questions. Um, but let's just do a little tune in and really see if we can notice how we're feeling today. Okay, so get comfy. Um, you don't have to sit a certain way to meditate. You have to sit upright and you have to have your spine supported. But I know for a lot of people, um, particularly my male students, they were very relieved to hear they didn't have to sit cross-legged. <laughs> like, oh, thank goodness. Um, you just have to sit comfortably, upright, comfortably, like you're watching TV. Uh, and then you want to have your head free. Okay, so if you do have something behind you, you want to have your head free, perfectly resting on the top of your spine. And then just close down your eyes and we'll just do a little breathing exercise. But first of all, with your eyes closed, notice how your attention has moved inwards. So instead of focusing on what I'm saying, trying to make sense of all those words,
place that focus upon your whole entire body. So feel the edges of your skin, how your skin holds this incredible mechanism, this incredible piece of machinery. The skin, the bones, the ligaments, the tendons, the blood vessels, all your organs, your heart beating, your tummy. And everything has momentum, everything has flow, everything's energy. So just take a couple of deep breaths. Notice the ebb and flow of breath. And then notice the tone or the very subtle sensations that move around your body, like a little electric current. How are you feeling today? What are you feeling today? Where are you feeling it today? And we can let our awareness linger on our tummy, what's happening in that area, or the solar plexus, so that place just above your belly button where the ribs meet. Maybe you're feeling something around your chest, your shoulders, your neck. Notice if you're holding on, can you relax? especially the jaw, especially the tongue, the neck, the shoulders. And then if you could describe how you're feeling, maybe you can give it an emotive word, or maybe you just need to feel it to understand what's happening in your body. Or maybe you don't know, and that is a beautiful place to start. Okay, now we're just gonna to breathe together. So I'd like you to exhale all the air out of your lungs, and then we're gonna breathe into a count of six. So inhaling for one, two, three, four, five, six. Hold the air in, hold right at the top for six, five, four, three, two, one, and then breathe out for six. Hold at the bottom for six. Breathe in for six. Hold at the top for six. Breathe out for six. Hold at the bottom for six. Breathe in for six and just keep going. So breathing in, holding, breathing out, holding. And maybe you can make it last longer than six counts. Maybe you can do seven, maybe you can do eight. Just play around with your inhale and exhale. But when you breathe in and hold right at the top, hold really full of air. And then when you breathe out, let it all go. And hold completely out with no oxygen. And we're just going to keep doing this for a minute or so.
Okay, on your next inhale, breathing in, breathing in, breathing in, holding. We're going to hold for as long as we can. So holding at the top, letting your body soften around the holding. And just keep holding, keep holding for as long as you can. And then when you feel ready, a big sigh, let everything go. And then just notice the tone, the frequency, whatever you're feeling in your body. Notice if there've been any subtle, subtle shifts. And we don't make them good, bad, right or wrong, better or worse. We just notice the difference. And then when you're ready, opening your eyes. I always reflect upon whenever I do breath work, whenever I do yoga, meditation, breath work, um, I find it just so incredible that these techniques, these disciplines, these skills have been around for 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 years. And 5,000, 6,000 years ago, we didn't need to hook in, they didn't need to hook anyone up to the machines to measure anything. So for thousands and thousands of years, they practiced these techniques to help us become more connected, more harmonious, um, more in tune with ourselves and with each other and the environments we found ourselves in. And it wasn't until 50 years ago that people were like, oh, we need to measure this. We need to figure out exactly what's going on. Um, there was just all this trust and deep intuition and probably using their bodies as, a, as an experiment to see um, how the practices worked and what they did. And I also, I feel really comforted in the knowledge that this practice has stood the test of time. People have been doing this for so long. Um, and one of the greatest tests is if it lasts a distance, if people are still doing these things, you just have to think about fashion, music, um, it's the classics that last. <laughs> it's the things that resonate with everyone that become universal truths. So I think for me, with that knowledge, um, I've had a lot of faith in this practice and that faith kept me there. And then over the years, um, I've experienced so many benefits that are honestly very subtle in some instances, pretty massive in other instances. Like it really helped me deal with my uh, drinking and um, some really unhealthy patterns of behavior that I had throughout my teens and, and 20s. It's definitely helped me become aware of them, first of all, and then gently shift uh, to be able to make slightly different choices, slightly different choices, more different choices. And then if I reflect um, to what my life was like a decade ago, 15 years ago, the difference is really, really phenomenal. And when I teach the course, I go into um, a lot more of that. Um, so the course is two parts. And after the course, you have all the information you need to become a self-sufficient daily meditator. Because the kicker is you have to meditate to experience the benefits. You can do the course and you can read the books, but you actually have to practice to experience the benefits. So one of the really important aspects of this is I teach you a lot about habits and why it can be hard to shift habits or create a new habit. It's really, really important to understand why it can be so tricky to implement, implement these new things into our lives. Um, so any questions? A couple of questions, Marika? Yeah, um, no, I'd, I actually want to invite everybody to um, the workshop next week of Claire. Um, it's on the 5th and the 6th, so that's Saturday, Sunday. 1.30 to 3 o'clock next Saturday. And um, we'd like to thank Claire for making her course very accessible to us. Um, there is uh, an energy exchange offer um, that's on offer till tomorrow. So go on her website. But we do encourage um, everybody to come. I think, um, you know, it's, it's been a long time. Urban Ashland's been around for nine years, but we did choose, took us a long time to find meditation, to, to find um, quietness. Um, so 
we'd like everybody to to come and attend 1 30 to 3 on friday and saturday and um a lot of us here a number of us have actually practiced with claire and we can tell you that this is the time where we need it the most and um, i think one of the things we try to do at the studio is to try to provide different venues by which we can find peace of mind and heart so and this is definitely something we we highly recommend so um claire thank you for your time and um You're welcome yeah, so if anybody has questions, please, please ask. And I forgot to mention, once you've done the course, you become part of our meditation community. So we have a Facebook group. I email my students all the time. I'm available for, um, you can, once I've taught you, it's my commitment that you can text me, you can email me anytime with questions because it's really, really important you have support in this, on this path, really, really crucial. And I didn't have that at the beginning of my, my practice. I didn't really, I hadn't found a teacher that resonated with me and some things happened and I was like, ah, what's going on? So it was really important to find a teacher that would help me through that. Uh, yeah, we have our meditation group and um, we uh, meditate together once every couple of weeks and I record them and put them in the Facebook group because there's always little bits of information that are helpful. And my students ask questions that resonate with everyone, which is always really helpful. Um, because once you do start meditating, it's quite tricky to talk about it with people who don't meditate. It's like describing a dream or you just sound like you've lost your mind. And so it is very nice to have a community of people that you can sound crazy with and feel good about it. <laughs> um, okay. Does, is that, is that all? <laughs> if, if, oh, here we go. We've got questions here. Um, is it normal to experience spontaneous body movement like shaking? Yes, you can. As your nervous system relaxes, you can, you can experience shakes, you can experience twitches. Um, sometimes it's even, you know, those moments when you're just about to fall asleep and it's like you fall off a cliff. All that is, is your nervous system letting go. So movement's a wonderful sign that um, your body is responding to the practice. Um, but yes, if you have any questions leading up to the course next week, um, Marika can give you my contact information. I'm not on Instagram at the moment, but you can email me um, with any questions and it will be lovely to share this with you um, during these very unusual and challenging times. Thank you all very, very much.